one point of light has the power to disarm darkness. And what the Bible says is that Jesus is the light of the world. And his presence disarms the darkness. His, his presence cancels out darkness. I'm so thankful because that darkness is not just something that's abstract. It's not just a global thing. It's in my own life, in my own heart. And so I want to talk about today, as we have our Christmas sermon today, what does it mean that Jesus is the light? And so open your Bibles with me to John chapter 1. <laughs> the lights can come back on. I apologize. I did it, made them do all that work to turn the lights off, and now they're going to turn them back on. All right, John 1. Starting at verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through Him all might believe. He Himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world. Uh, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Um, skip to John eight twelve. And if you can't flip there fast enough, I'll just read it. John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Uh, just a couple of questions I want to answer concerning our, our passage. What does it mean that the world was dark? Second, what does it mean that Jesus is the light of the world? And then third, what does that have to do with me, if anything? So very simple. Why is the world considered dark? Why is Jesus the light? What does that mean? And what does it have to do with me? So let me pray real quick and we'll, we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for um, your people. Thank you, Jesus, that we can come and know you as the light of the world, the light of our own lives. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. This day is about you. Every day is about you, but in particular, we take this day to honor you for coming into our world. We love you and pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the world as a dark place. Next slide. The world as a dark place. Um, you notice in the book of John these contrasts between light and darkness. It's, the book of John um, has these amazing contrasts, light and dark being one of the primary. And the Bible doesn't hesitate. John, the author, doesn't hesitate to identify the world with darkness, because the light of heaven comes into a dark world. That's the background of John 1. So why the world as a dark place? When the Bible speaks of the world, it's not referring to the pretty blue-green orb that you see in space. It's not necessarily talking about the planet itself being dark. When the Bible calls the world dark, it's referring to a system within the world. Uh, notice in Isaiah 13, 11, uh, God says to his people, I will punish the world for its evil, the wickedness for their sins. John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. And so when the Bible talks about the world, it's differentiating God from the system of evil that operates throughout the world. The world in the biblical mind is the output of all our rebellion, all our sin, all our evil, all our wickedness, everything that we say, do, think that's wrong and violates the will of God, all of that. Like, imagine this, our spiritual exhaust fumes putting out smog, putting out just junk. That covering the earth is what the Bible calls the world, the embodiments of evil. Now, what's interesting is that the world did not start out this way, right? God called the world very good when he made it. But then you all know about Adam and Eve, how they initiated the first sin, 
And within a few generations, you literally have every sin that we currently see in the world, from incest to rape to murder to lust to, to, to everything. Everything happened within a generation or two. All of that came into our existence. And like a cancer that just rapidly spreads, it infected everything so that nothing in this world is untouched by evil. Think of it like I just shared, a smog that sits on our planet of moral wickedness and evil. There's this uh, moment in history uh, back in 1952 in London. Um, I I didn't know about this. I I read about it. Um, So on a cold winter day, um, all the Londoners were putting coal in their ovens to, you know, to get heat, but it was producing, you know, a bad smog, which made the London fog even thicker and colder, and it sat. And so people feeling colder would put more coal in, and it created this vicious loop, this cycle of people feeling colder, they put more coal in, putting more smog in the air, making the air thicker and heavier, and eventually... Uh, On Sunday, December 7th of 1952, visibility fell to one foot. They had to slaughter all the cows because their lungs were filled with black tar. People couldn't see. And by the time this smog blew away, 12,000 people died in London. One of the worst ecological disasters in history. Do you guys know about this? I I read about this recently. And I think it's such a powerful illustration of how the Bible and how the author John saw the world, of just our individual output of evil adding to the evil that already exists so that it's a heavy, toxic cloud that sits in the earth. Darkness. And it's not as if things have changed in 50-plus years or 1,000-plus years. You look around the headlines, and there's ISIS and all kinds of stuff happening all around the world that's so terribly evil. And if you are tempted to think that that kind of evil is foreign and, and something way out there, I mean, think of Columbine and Sandy Hook and Ferguson and Charleston and more recently San Bernardino and just, it's, it's still here. And even away from the headlines, you look at some of the people that in your lives that you love and the brokenness that you see in their relationships and in their families and the stuff they're doing to themselves and you realize that darkness is in my friends, and then you take a look under your hood, and you know, I could think of a number of things I've said to my wife, I've said to my kids, the things I've muttered under my breath in road rage. Listen, if you don't think you're evil, <laughs> pay attention to what you think and what you say in the car. I have wished to wipe out people's existence. <laughs> like, why are there so many people ahead of me? Why can't just they disappear? And I don't even stop to think that I'm literally wiping out people's lives and fathers and mothers and children in that process, but, but in my head, I'm murdering them all. It's terrible. And the Bible says that no one is righteous, not even one. It's so true. And I'm sorry to kind of take a dark turn on a Christmas morning, but, but, but listen, listen, like it was last night for me, you don't appreciate light until it gets dark, right? I, I care less about my candles until that's all I had. And so if you want to know that Jesus is the light of the world, you have to understand the context he came into. It was a dark planet. It's still a dark planet without Jesus. Next point. Jesus the light. The opening passage, the opening of the passage, the Bible describes Jesus being the Word. The Word. And this has incredible significance because the Word was the Word of God, right? When, when the Bible speaks of the Word, it's talking about the revelation of God, the mouth of God speaking. And in the biblical mind, what you say equals who you are. So oftentimes, um, like creation was done through His Word. God would move upon His people through His Word. His Word would do this. His Word would accomplish this. And so in the biblical uh, point of view, the Word was equal to all that is God, All that God is, is expressed through his word. And so when the Bible says that Jesus is the word, it's saying something very important about the nature of Jesus. That Jesus is the word of God. That Jesus is the fullest expression of who God is. And then this passage makes it explicit. Right? 
because it says that Jesus is the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word is God. And so here's what happened. If Jesus is the Word of God, this is what's happening. When it says that God's Word accomplished this, it means that God commands and Jesus does. So when it says that God said, let there be light, Jesus was fashioning light. When God said, let there be an earth, and and he made seas and mountains, it was Jesus' hands carving out the basin of the Pacific. It was Jesus' hands crumpling the ground so that there's mountains. There's that intimate connection. Yes. God commands, Jesus does. That's how closely they were related. They were together, God. And so when Jesus is called the light, we're not talking about like that halo kind of saintly glow you see in paintings, you know, like a secondary light or a tertiary light. We're talking about the very light of God. That Jesus was was exuding the same light of God for all eternity past. The very light that fuels the stars in the heavens. The light that is so potent that there needs to be no celestial bodies. The light of God lights up all of heaven. That was in Jesus. Jesus always had that. He is the light of heaven, the light of God, the furious light of God where the angels, it says so there's some really cool like higher ranking angels with multiple wings and two of those wings cover their eyes because even the angels cannot look upon the brilliance of God. And Jesus had that light. And it says that that light came into our world. And I just want to say thank you, God, <laughs> for sending us his very light into our world. But you would think, given the dire situation, I talked about the world being dark and the light of heaven coming, you would at least put that thing on a glorious stand like this. This is from my bathroom right here, this thing. (laughs) Um, It literally is from my bathroom. I mean, I at least put something nice to put this uh, Christmas candle on. So you would think if God is going to bring his light, his very light of heaven onto our planet, he would have it mounted on a giant candle stand, metaphorically. Um, have Jesus born into a palace, to royalty. So that's unquestionable, that this is my son who is a king. Or at least have a, um, a mount a big political campaign. So he's thrusted into the spotlight of the world. Take over Rome. Please, God, take over Rome, who is occupying this, the Palestine area and oppressing the Jews, his people. Or at least, you know, uh, bring him into a tribe of priests who can train him up from day one so that he is on, on the throne of the religious institutions. But Jesus, the light of the world, next slide, comes through the bloody legs of a peasant girl out in some dingy barn. Our passage says the world did not recognize this light. And no wonder he was born a refugee baby in some back alley. And the question I ask is, why like this? Why, if you're God, God, if you're bringing your own light of heaven into the world, why like this? 30 years, he grows up up in obscurity as a peasant carpenter. And then after 30 years, he begins to preach. And his light begins to shine a little brighter. Then he starts to do miracles, cast out demons, heal the sick, the blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the, the deaf are hearing, and the light shines even brighter, and now he's a bit of a rock star. People are flocking to him. Then he, people notice that he teaches with a different kind of authority, that the way he speaks, no one else speaks like him because it's like, almost like he's hearing directly from God, and he inspires people because he's preaching about the last becoming first about sinners who are loved by a father who runs to them, about how you, if you repent of your sins and give your life uh, to God, that you can experience eternal life. And that was debated among Jewish people at that time. Not everyone believed in the resurrection. And here is this guy saying, I came from heaven, and you can go there too. So he'd say these amazing things that, that tax collectors, the prostitutes, the peasants would be like, yes. But then he'd also say some really challenging things too. Like you have to die before you live, that you have to be born again, that you have to lay down everything and follow him, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he would even die 
for their sins, but resurrect. Like some weird things, people are like, oh, I don't know. But the light was shining bright. And it shone on people that the Jews did not expect the, the Messiah would shine on. People of the lowest caste, people who were untouchables, people who were broken and, and sin, sinful in quotes, and just people that had no standing in society, Jesus would spend the most time with them. Through it all, in those three years, a light started to shine very brightly in Palestine. And then almost as brilliant as this light just popped into the world, this light got snuffed out, seemingly. Because people who were jealous of him, people who hated him, satanic forces, took Jesus to the cross, nailed him to a tree, and he would die and be sealed up in a tomb. It said that during that time, an unnatural darkness fell upon the earth. And then, uh, to, to add uh, insult to injury, he was rolled uh, into, or he was brought into a tomb, and a giant stone lid was rolled over it so that it was pitch black. No light. The light of heaven snuffed out. But then, something amazing happens Easter happens. Right? It says that angels came, and, and they came with the light of heaven, brilliant, it, so much so that the guards fell dumbstruck. They were terrified, and the stone is removed, and there is no body because Jesus has resurrected. And that light that was, that was dimmed by swaddling cloth, that light that was dimmed by humanity, that light that we, people saw in glimpses through his teaching, through the miracles through the way he loved broken people, now that light was fully revealed in the glory of God through the resurrected Savior. And when you think about all of that, that whole narrative, you begin to understand why the light of God came through such tenuous and vulnerable circumstances. How the light came down, but way, way down at the level of a refugee baby born in a manger, out in some back alley, growing up in obscurity, because we are convinced through this testimony that that light has something to do with me. Because if he was exalted on a throne, born to kings and priests, what do I have to do with that? But Jesus experienced everything we experienced. Everything, every wound, every betrayal, every temptation. He can identify with the lowest of the low because he was there. And, and what's great is that he enmeshed himself into such darkness. He fully identified with the broken world and to the point that he identified with our death. He died the death that we deserve. The Bible says that God transferred onto him all our sin, all our shame, all our junk, including our death. But the beauty of Christmas is that even the tomb could not hold him. Right? The light of heaven... I know I'm preaching Easter, but really Christmas and Easter are tied together. The light of the world, the light of the world, even the tomb could not snuff out that light, right? Even the tomb could not snuff out that light, because it says here in John uh, chapter 1, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome it. Satan threw everything possible at Jesus, even killed him, put him in a tomb, rolled a giant stone that's immovable by man unless you have an army, literally. And that could not stuff out the light. Which tells us this morning, whatever tomb Satan wants to put you in, whatever darkness he wants to wrap you in, whatever ditch and pit he's put you in and tarped you over, the light of Jesus can overcome. Because it says his victory is our victory. If you put your faith in him, it says in John chapter 1, you can be sons and daughters of God and have that very light in you. I'm, I'm ahead of myself. Next point. What does this mean for me? I want you to think of it this way. Think of it this way. The Christmas story is not about just a historical moment where the Messiah came onto this planet and Jesus being the light of the world as some beautiful abstraction, some poetic thing. I want you to see it as Jesus, the light of the world, coming into my darkness, into my brokenness, into my tomb, 
into the broken, hopeless things that have been sealed off by Satan, saying, Satan, Satan will tell us, you can't touch this, you're forever this, you're forever going to be like this. I want Christmas to be the moment where light breaks into that. Because when we say Jesus is the light of the world, I mean, this is a small example, but last night when I lit that candle and brought it into the house and everyone could see, it was like, ah, it was like I could hear like music in my, like, light, we have light, there's hope. Like, we can function. We're not going to walk around in darkness and colliding into each other and the kids being terrified. Like, we have light. The light of the world is about hope. It's hope. I think of this story, um, and I'm starting to land this plane, so uh, if Jeff can come behind me. Um, a story of two fishermen. Maybe I have this slide. Uh, perfect. Um, two fishermen go out um, late at night into the bay, because that's when you catch the biggest fish. But a heavy fog rolled in, and they're in treacherous water with jagged rocks. Um, if they make a wrong turn, they can, you know, split their boat open and capsize. And it, this is cold, frigid water. So they, get to get, they, get, they begin to get nervous. And a few minutes turn to a few hours, and they have no clue where they are, and they don't know how to navigate. And it's the middle of the night. And so they're, they're, they're scared, they're, they're nervous. But off in the distance, they see a point of light. And that point of light was a harbor light where they launched from. And the moment they saw that light, there was hope. Because they don't have to know anything else. They don't have to know where they are. They don't have to know where the rocks are. They just have to head to that light and they're safe. This morning, you might have some heavy fog in your life. Marriage got really hard all of a sudden, or maybe for a long time. Your work situation turned a corner and it's really hard. You might be confused. You might have ran into a corner with God where you don't know where you are, brokenness in your relationships. I mean, I could stand up here and list any number of things that have gone wrong in 2015. And I want you to know this morning there's hope because as long as you have just a tiny view of the light of Jesus, if your faith just allows for like a little diamond of light, head towards it. That's where safety is. That's where refuge is. That's where freedom and breakthrough is. So I don't know what that means for you this morning, what it means to head to Jesus as the light. It might mean coming to church again next week because this might be the first time for you in a long time and God's beginning to melt your heart. It could be that you go to small group and start meeting with people and doing life on life and sharing and getting uh, words of life spoken into you. It might mean letting go of something, taking on something, repenting of something. I don't know what Jesus wants to do with you, but I want you to know that rather than focusing on the rocks, wondering where you are at the water, trying to gauge the temperature, just forget all that, head to Jesus. Take a step of faith towards Jesus and you will find refuge. You will find life. You will find hope. You will find meaning. Like a candle lighting up a dark room, that's what Jesus will do to your heart. A couple invitations I want to give before we close. 